You're about to see edited highlights from one of the lengthiest and most complex cases in legal history. Everything about it is highly fictitious, and the proceedings are not all that legally accurate. The characters in it are played by actors, and the jury is made up of people who've expressed their willingness to arrive impartially at whatever verdict may be required of them. The case concerns a libel action brought by cosmic planning consultants against the Rosenberg Research Foundation, and counsel for the former is now opening his case. I appear for the plaintiffs, my lad, and my friend Mr. Keith Saunders is counsel for the defendants. I propose first to outline the facts of the case, which is in essence a simple one, turning on the fact that a building on the edge of a steep escarpment in the Cairngorms, some 3,000 feet or so above sea level, was, in 1975, turned into an old people's home with the usual facilities. Of these facilities, it is with the lavatories that we are principally concerned, in that these were placed at the foot of the escarpment, 3,000 feet below the old people's home they were intended to serve. It was my clients who were acting as consultants in the matter and who are bringing this action against the defendants in respect of a libel contained in a letter and later in a newspaper interview. If I might crave the indulgence of the court at this stage, my lad, I would like to go over briefly the background of the situation. The facts are not in dispute between us. The original name of the building which underwent conversion in 1975 to an old people's home was Bellamy's Folly, an edifice constructed in the early years of this century by one Horace Bellamy as a left luggage office. It was intended as the first of a chain of left luggage offices encircling the globe and enabling those with heavy luggage and finding themselves at the top of some mountain or other to have somewhere to deposit the luggage while they themselves admired the view and ate their sandwiches. It was a bold concept, but one which <laughs> was, in the event, doomed to be stillborn. The harsh facts were that people, people could not be persuaded to take their luggage to the top of an escarpment in the Cairngorms or in anything like sufficient numbers to justify the considerable expense of maintaining it there. The building, accordingly, fell into disuse remained empty for some time, becoming known as Bellamy's Folly. He himself, embittered by what he thought of as unfair competition from the left luggage offices in the mainline termini, which had at that time gained a stranglehold in the left luggage business, finally committed suicide by casting himself down from the withdrawals counter, or what had been the withdrawals counter, to the foot of the escarpment, 3,000 feet below, hitting the ground by a curious coincidence at the very spot where the lavatories were to be built over 50 years later, in the people's home uh, to which reference has already been made. Did you say competition for the mainline railway termini? Uh, that is thought to have been in his mind, my lord. Is it being suggested that someone at the top of the Matterhorn or of Everest, since that was in his mind eventually, would go to the trouble of making a descent of ten to 20,000 feet with a heavy suitcase in either hand in order then to travel perhaps several thousand miles in a stuffy and uncomfortable train with no other purpose but to deposit his suitcases at Euston Station, possibly meeting surly and off-hand treatment when he got there? No, it seems a few people were making the original journey, my lad, from Euston to the top of the Cairngorms or wherever. Well, what inducements were offered them? Well, it was thought that the challenge itself would be a sufficient inducement, my lad. That is the plaintiff's case, my lad, and I will now call my evidence. <clears throat> call Kenneth James Hoist Petard. Counsel for the plaintiffs has called the head of the Rosenberg Research Foundation to the witness box. It will be his purpose to show that there were sound reasons for the publishing of the allegedly libelous words. Bellamy's folly, as we must continue to call it, was intended to be very much the showpiece, was it not? As the first in the line of similar homes for the aged in other high spots elsewhere in the world. It was, yes. It was indeed 
received with considerable acclaim in the press and elsewhere. A tremendous breakthrough, a triumph, one paper put it, of high-altitude geriatry. We were pleased with the response. As a result, uh, the result of this, it was inaugurated with great pomp and ceremony in a blaze of publicity. We were happy with the coverage. Is it not true that such experiments in high-altitude geriatry as were urgently needed at that time uh, could have been carried out every bit as effectively and, some may say, far more humanely by sending one or two selected old-age pensioners up in a hot-air balloon once or twice a week from, say, Cock Foster's? Uh, this was very seriously considered, and it had a lot to be said for it. But in the end, we opted for the left luggage office. In order the better to acclimatise the, as we may now say, unfortunate guinea pigs in this experiment, to relatively high altitudes before sending them into orbit for reasons of limited space on the ground. That was part of the object. Mm. Great-grandmothers in orbit. A concept that, given this kind of publicity, could not fail to appeal. I think the time was right for it. And accordingly, it caught the imagination of the public. It did, yes. Mm. I cannot possibly allow counsel to go on leading the witness in this way. You really must try to phrase these questions in a less tendentious way. I'm obliged to your lordship. To what extent was this whole enterprise not something of a pipe dream? We felt it had great potentiality. Would it be true to say that Rosenberg Research Foundation were being somewhat starry-eyed about the whole thing? We had our feet very firmly on the ground. More firmly, perhaps, than some of the unfortunate old-age pensioners who would ill-advisedly opted to act as guinea pigs, one might perhaps say. At all events, it has to be admitted, does it not, that the whole concept quickly became, in the minds of the general public, a damp squib, a nine-days wonder. And public support accordingly fell off with alarming and disconcerting rapidity. It didn't catch on quite in the way that we'd hoped. And all I would suggest was the diminution in public support the only problem confronted you. Other snags were beginning to come to light. Many, for instance, of the firms <laughs> who'd agreed so eagerly to deliver provisions and groceries and other necessaries when this had been a matter of climbing onto a popular bandwagon were now beginning to have second thoughts. This was fermented when a couple of removal men jibbed at carrying a Welsh dresser up the sheer face of a 3,000-foot mountain. They were troublemakers. And it spread. With the result that the old age pensioners themselves were compelled to make first the descent and then the ascent to collect their own shopping. For a time. Hmm. Not an easy matter for someone of advancing years with a full shopping basket, I would presume. Hmm? It did raise a certain amount of comment, yes. I would suggest that public disquiet was considerable. That questions indeed were asked in the House. That is true. Might it be true to say that you found this, uh, this uh, project somewhat embarrassing? It wasn't something that we welcomed. How well, convenient, then, if you could find a scapegoat on whom to foist responsibility for this unwelcome development. There was no intention of foisting responsibility at all. Mm. Nevertheless, if it could be made known that some gross oversight had been perpetrated, not by you, but by the plaintiffs, an oversight whereby the inmates of the old folks' home could be shown to have been put to some minor inconvenience. <laughs> it would deflect a great deal of public criticism. Away from you, would it not? And on to the plaintiffs. And what better such oversight than the placing of the lavatories in such a position that it would be impossible to reach them in the middle of the night without wearing climbing boots over one's bedroom slippers? This was not the intention at all. Thank you. I have no questions to ask of this witness, my lad. None? No, my lad. So be it. <clears throat> In the absence of cross-examination, counsel for the plaintiffs calls his next witness, the Cosmic Planning Consultant's Chief Planning Advisor, Nigel Winterbourne. As a consultant of some standing in the consultancy world, you're well versed, are you not, in the art of consultancy? Many people consider so. And to the extent that it would be true, to, perhaps, to say that you have consultancy in the blood. And that consultancy, in all its myriad forms, has been your life right up until this moment, and indeed still is. I'd like to think so. Mm. You showed a certain precocity for this, even as a child, I believe. 
I was said to be forward, yes, in that particular field. With the result that in adult life, you have been called in on, on a consultancy basis on numerous occasions in the non-communist world. You are now, are you not, chief planning advisor to the cosmic planning consultants who are the plaintiffs in this action? That is so. And as such, you were intimately involved, were you not, with the project about which complaints have been made? I was. Mm. Project was a somewhat ambitious one, I presume. It was one of some magnitude, yes. Mm. Is it perhaps to be expected that in a project on so large and ambitious a scale, minor snags might be expected to appear? To one would be very lucky to get it absolutely right first time. Such a mistake as putting lavatories at the bottom when the home they were to serve was at the top. Might, well, might be an oversight of no great order, perhaps. <laughs> It might seem so to the individual old age pensioner mm. called upon to make the journey down and then up again, but in terms of the project as a whole, it was uh, considered a very minor point indeed, hardly worth the expense of rectifying. Thank you. Are you cross-examining this time? With your Lordship's permission. By all means. The peace and serenity, which it is normal to associate with a home for the elderly in their declining years, is in danger of being put at some risk, is it not? if one finds oneself trudging some 3,000 feet down a steep escarpment with many treacherous overhangs in one's dressing gown at three o'clock in the morning to attend to a call of nature. There's a danger, certainly. There might, might there not be prima facie grounds for complaint by some who think this is no way to spend the autumn of one's life. It's not easy to please everyone. The comment might be made as to what might appear at first sight to be an absence of forethought to the extent that the question, what kind of planning consultants are these? might find yourself being asked in certain quarters with an element of rancour. Well, this is something one has to learn to come to terms with. Who was passing through your mind inciting the laboratories where you did? I was thinking of Mrs. Letchworth. What was the tenor of your thoughts concerning this Mrs. Letchworth? It occurred to me that she was highly desirable and that I had a chance there. In other words, your thoughts were elsewhere than on the job you'd undertaken to give your undivided attention to? I suppose that would be so. A case, one might say, of Cherche la Femme. <laughs> yes, one might say that. You said that, in your opinion, the oversight was a minor one, that it was an oversight of no very great order, except to those inconvenienced by it. And what about the danger that, in bedroom slippers, a 93-year-old lady, not perhaps too steady on her pins, as the expression is, might miss her footing and fall from top virtually to bottom? A feasibility study was carried out in 1970. No dangers of that nature were anticipated. Is it true that there are mattresses placed against the bottom of the sheer north face, against this very <laughs> contingency? Unanticipated, though you say it was. These were placed there subsequently. As an afterthought, and in response to public outcry, when it was found that old age pensioners, falling from some considerable height, were going straight through to the underworld on hitting the ground. To the where? Oh, the underworld, my lad, sometimes known as Hades. You mean the infernal regions? Oh, yes, my lad. Then say so. Indeed, it is true, is it not, that some of the pensioners, even after the provision of mattresses, were continuing to go straight through, this time taking the mattresses with them. <laughs> and I put it to you that it is no part of the divine purpose that man or woman should, after leading a possibly blameless life for 70 or 80 years, make his or her entrance into the infernal regions like a sack of coals coming down a chute, arrive in Hades unannounced and wrapped in a mattress. And one might be set to have got off to a dubious start so far as the afterlife is concerned. It could lead to problems. It could lead to eternal damnation. I suppose so, yes. Well, scarcely an inviting prospect, mattress or no mattress. I suppose not. It is to establish this vital point beyond any shadow of doubt that at a later stage in the hearing, defence counsel brings a man of God to the witness box. If one were so unfortunate as to be damned eternally, one would know all about it, I presume. Oh, yes, indeed. And it is for this reason, in the main, that uh, one advises one's parishioners against it. Nothing to look forward to except an endless round of sin and vice, indulged in unremittingly for the better part, perhaps, of eternity, until such glamour as it might once have had has long since departed from it. That would be about the size of it, yes. It would take all pleasure out of the afterlife and leave one feeling fit for very little afterwards. Anyone of pensionable age would very likely find it too much for them. Nor, presumably, would there be any getting out of it at all easily. If you don't take part with the others, show willing, as the expression is, you are looked at, one imagines, as something of a leper, 
and might possibly be sent to Coventry by your fellow damnees. It is possible to get out of it by pleading sick, if you don't for any reason feel up to it for an eon or two. But they're not exactly enraptured when you do. Satan, in particular, taking a somewhat poor view. T Satan would come down like a ton of bricks. Uh, one would come, moreover, would one not, on frequent occasions, face to face with Satan. That is so, yes. Who is not the sort of person one would want to meet on a dark night, I would imagine. <laughs> Indeed not. Many a person has been frightened out of his wits by such an encounter unexpectedly. One would normally say, in that sort of situation, get thee behind me, Satan. One would scarcely feel any safer within there, I imagine. He has been known to uh, take advantage. Almost too great a temptation to resist, one would imagine. I think at this point we might resist the temptation to go any further with this line of questioning. We will adjourn and return at 2.15. As we return to Crown Court, cross-examination by counsel should be continuing, but a hitch has occurred, whereby a Mrs. Start Ferret has taken the place in the witness box of the chief planning adviser, having asked to be seen early and out of turn, owing to commitments elsewhere. As her evidence has nothing to do with the present case, counsel is having to rephrase his questions in the light of this. This is highly irregular. You do realise that? Yes, I do, Your Honour. Well, you must bear that in mind throughout... Otherwise, you may find yourself in contempt of court, in which case I shall have no alternative but to sentence you to be detained in the cells until such time as you have made a full and unconditional apology to the court. Yes, I am aware of that, sir. And as a result of this, you paid a visit to a solicitor, I believe. That's right. Are we taking this evidence in the middle? It would seem better that way, my lad. Very good. Can you tell us how this visit came about? I was talking to my friend and telling him what had happened which I won't bother with now. And he said, would you like to see a solicitor? So I said, I've already seen one. He said, where? I said, on the television. He said, would you recognise him again? I said, yes, anywhere. So he said, right, what are we waiting for? Then as a result, you fetched up, I think I'm right in saying, at the offices of Purdue, Gabitas, Tatchbrook and Hobart, commissioners for old. Yes, to see Mr Hobart. Whom you immediately recognised as the one you had seen on television. Oh, yes, it was the same one, all right. And your first words to him were what? I said, can you hear an oath? And he went across to the open window with his hand cupped round his ear and he said, no. I don't think so, can you? Whereupon? Whereupon, I said, it's my brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law comes into this in what way? Well, he'd hurt himself. Having hit his thumb with a hammer while nailing up a picture of the infant Jesus. That's right. And he wanted, without delay, to come out with an oath of some description in order to relieve his feelings. He was hopping about from one foot to the other. Having been bottling it up for some time while you were looking for solicitor. And with a homemade gag in his mouth to prevent the premature utterance of the oath. That's right. He was all set to utter it the moment the gag was removed. When the formalities were completed? Yes. What was the oath he was all set to come out with? Well... May I write it down? Yes, he can write it down. Hells, bells and buckets of blood. There were several possibilities that he had a list. That was his first choice. What was the reaction of your Mr Hobart, the solicitor you had seen on television and were now confronting in the flesh, to the information that this was, this was what you wanted to see him about. He was very understanding and produced this chair leg. Chair leg? It was about so long, my lord. Uh, with what purpose in mind? Well, he said the formalities might take some little time. Yes. Well, he was doubled up, you see, with a pain as well as jumping about. Well, how does a chair leg come into this? Well, he said, as the formalities might take some little time and he was in pain, he might like to be put under sedation till they were completed. He said it was one of the few concessions that the law allowed to uh, human frailty and we might as well take advantage of it. By striking him over the head with, with the, the chair, chair leg. Is this common practice? I've had no personal experience of it, my lad. We were hoping to have it under the swear now, pay later scheme. Well, couldn't all this have been done over the telephone? Husbands ringing in from public call boxes purporting to be swearing on behalf of wives and sweethearts. Greengrocers impersonating members of Parliament in order to let rip under the cloak of privilege. Make a mockery of the whole business, my lad. They said it could be the thin end of a very ugly wedge. Yes, I see the force of that, I suppose. Very well. So I said, couldn't he have voice training first? 
voice training. I wanted his voice to be in tip-top condition, so that he'd do full justice to the oath when the time came. Otherwise, it was money down the drain. Well, surely no man in his right senses would attempt to nail up a picture of the infant Jesus unless his larynx was in reasonably good nick, as the expression is, to start with. Oh, I think we've had enough of this witness and can now revert to the original witness whose evidence was interrupted. Yes, Your Lordship, please. No. This woman has had an unusually long run for her money and, as she leaves the court, clearly seems to realise it. Oh, yes, very satisfied. I've no complaints at all. A very generous allowance of time. Yes, I was very pleased. The chief planning consultant is now back in the witness box and the examination can continue. Not all, by any means, of the various projects on which cosmic planning consultants have been called in as advisors have received universal acclaim. I'm referring in particular to the scheme, elaborately worked out by you, for a midnight sunbathing Lido on the Dead Sea, over which you were severely criticised in having failed to take into account the relative absence of effective sunlight at that time during the 24 hours. I won't deny we had to take a certain amount of stick over that. You were, if I may refresh your memory, very frank and open about it at the time, going so far as to admit in a letter I have before me now, which I shall pass to his lordship and to the jury presently, that in some respects you had failed, in your own words, to do our homework on this one. We tried to take a reasonable line on it, certainly. There are a number of letters relating to all manner of enterprises, including this one, addressed this time to a Mr Driscoll. Dear Mr Driscoll, it begins, it would appear to have happened again. We seem plagued by gremlins, and it seems that your decision to build a bird sanctuary underground was made on advice wrongly given to you by us. This is the kind of slip-up which can, however, all too easily occur, as I am sure you realise, and should not be blown up out of all proportion. Neither would it be advisable to shout it too much from the housetops, as this could make difficulties for everyone. Sealed lips, in other words, seem once more to be the order of the day. Lay people who don't have the experience to judge can sometimes put the wrong interpretation on things, such as when, for example, a building falls down or a bridge collapses. As when a tower block some years ago collapsed like a house of cards within ten months of being completed. A tower block on which cosmic planning consultants were the advisors. That was due to a fault in the design for which we refused to accept any responsibility. It was precisely the design you were brought in as advisors, was it not? Our function was to tender advice, this we did. Advice on the basis of which the block was constructed in such a way as to fall down shortly after being put up. The advice we gave was given in good faith. There was no obligation whatsoever on the part of the construction company to follow that advice. They took this responsibility entirely on their own initiative. We're perfectly in the clear in the matter. As in no fewer than 231 disasters of a greater or lesser magnitude on which, over a period of years, you were acting as consultants. It's too easy for outsiders to apportion blame in these circumstances. Our conscience is perfectly clear. It is clear that counsel is not going to be able to shake this witness in any way or wring any concession out of him that might damage his position, notwithstanding the damage that might have been done to others, though the case is by no means over yet. Join us tomorrow for another instalment in the case of Cosmic Planning Consultants versus the Rosenberg Research Foundation. <laughs>